Well, 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 if it isn't Player 3 refreshing their GPUs. The Intel Arc B580 is what I've got up for review in this video on Linux. There's a lot we have to talk about. Okay, if you've been living under a rock, Intel actually makes the discrete GPUs other than the embedded GPU. Uh, Arc A770 was a particularly popular choice among Linux users, at least on the Level 1 Text Forum, and for a lot of reasons. One is that generally on Linux, Intel's driver stack is very mature and very well supported by Intel. This is Battle Mage, the B series, the B580, the next generation, and so we really should take a look at it because it has a lot of neat interesting features. First up, the physical hardware. It's a small card. This is a $250 US retail card. It has a small PCB with flow through cooling. It's a compact design. It's a return to sanity really. I mean a lot of Linux users are not really interested in giant three, four, five slot GPUs, something that needs 700 watts of power. This thing only has a single 8 pin connector. Uh, it also is pretty power efficient when it comes to idle power consumption and, and all the other fixings. It has one physical HDMI port, three DisplayPort ports, but the DisplayPort port that has a an outline is uh, UHBR13. So it's better than DisplayPort 1.4, but it's not quite full fat DisplayPort 2.1 but this can do high refresh rates. And one departure here with the HDMI port, see on the ARC CPUs, the predecessors from Intel, it was actually pretty genius. It, there was physical HDMI ports, but they had hardware to convert the display port physical to HDMI. There is this weird, annoying situation with the HDMI consortium where they're not comfortable supporting open source HDMI drivers on Linux. And that's literally all it is. That level of idiocy is preventing good HDMI support from happening on Linux, whether that's Intel or uh, AMD or, or anybody is, uh, that's pretty much universally true unless you're running a closed source binary blob because the HDMI consortium sees uh, the obfuscation and terribleness of the display interface formats as a way to make money, erecting um, toll booths, if you will, to extract rents from well-meaning computer users. So HDMI kind of becoming a tainted technology in my book, not really a fan. And Intel, what they did in the A-series GPUs was use the physical hardware converter. So you don't have to worry about that kind of shenanigans on Linux. Well, good news, bad news, it's a real HDMI connection so you can do FreeSync and G-Sync because FreeSync and G-Sync don't survive hardware converters properly. This is a real HDMI port, so you're not going to get full HDMI 2.1 on Linux, at least in my preliminary testing. If I'm wrong about that, I'll pin a comment below, because I would love to be, like, literally the only thing holding that back is just firmware. But in terms of DisplayPort interface, perfectly competent DisplayPort 2.1. I've tested DisplayStream compression, 4K, 120Hz refresh on inexpensive and expensive monitors. Now, the Intel driver stack is a little different than Windows. I tested this card on Windows, and I did a full analysis on Windows, and on the Windows side of things, the driver stack and hardware maturity is quite high. Uh, one of the key indicators there is how much power the card uses at idle, and even beyond that for me, is how much power the card uses at idle in high refresh rate scenarios. You see, a lot of the time, and this is true of NVIDIA and AMD, when you have a GPU that has multiple displays and multiple displays operate at a fairly high refresh, it causes the GPU to have to be in kind of a high power state all of the time. With this GPU, if you have ASPM enabled and your motherboard properly supports ASPM, which is a taller order on desktop boards than most people realize, then this card will idle as low as 13 watts. A more typical idle is in the 20 to 30 watt range when we're talking about high refresh rate monitors. If your monitor only, you've got the one and it only goes to 60 hertz, you're probably gonna be more in like that less than 20 hertz range, but there you go. Let me log in here. And now as this is Linux, uh, you know, driver maturity and hardware maturity and kernel maturity is gonna factor in there. And this card is probably not gonna work out of the box with whatever distro you choose. You really need to be running kernel 6.13 or later, but 
Intel, for their part, has dotted all of the I's and crossed all the T's. The firmware for this is already up on Linux firmware. You don't really have to do anything super exotic. You do need to run uh, the Git version of Mesa at the time that I'm doing this video, and you can run the Git version of the Linux kernel. Uh, but I also tried the Fedora Rawhide kernel on uh, both Nobara and Bazite. But um, uh, I, I did have some trouble benchmarking games. Um, Rockstar has completely flushed all Linux goodwill in the toilet. I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I've got to be a negative Nancy today. But uh, yeah, even just Red Dead Redemption 2, the pirate version of Red Dead Redemption 2 continues to work flawlessly. Whereas the version that I paid for, that's on Steam, intermittently has problems logging onto the Rockstar Social Club and occasionally says activation error. That's Rockstar depriving me of property. That's theft. That's cattle rustling in the form of computer games, which was a capital offense back in the day. If you were interfering with someone's ability to uh, earn a livelihood, Rockstar. Just say it. I asked you to do the singularity and other game performance. How does it stack up on Linux? Well, on Windows, it was incredibly impressive. Incredibly, incredibly impressive. And on Linux, for a $250 card, it is very impressive, but it's not as impressive as it was on Windows. I think there is a lot of rough edges but none of them are showstoppers, and most of the rough edges come in uh, performance anomalies and not anything that is just outright completely broken. Well, except for Cyberpunk. A little bit. Well, if you fiddle with the graphics settings, you can fix it, but you can see that there's some wild stuff going on here. Sometimes this kind of thing is attributable to the Mesa version. You may have an incorrect version of Mesa. You're running hardware that's too bleeding edge, so in probably like a month or two, I need to do a follow-up video on the B580, maybe look for that on the level one Linux channel, you know, on this channel, like for other stuff to see if these things have been fixed and to see if they're, they're rolled into a distro. But generally game performance is pretty good. And the game performance of this $250 card was on par with a 7600 XT, which is at least $50 more expensive at the time that I'm doing this video. Of course, the one fly in the ointment in that is that both Nvidia and AMD are getting ready to refresh their GPUs. So there's, there's gonna be like, you know, 8,000 series or 9,000 series GPUs or something from AMD soon at the beginning of 2025, and that could change the price to performance dynamic. Right now today, this card is the best performance per dollar on Linux if you're interested in 1080p medium high settings, maybe 1440p depending on the game. Games like CS2, they ran pretty good, no complaints there. Uh, other games like Ashes of the Benchmark, Ashes of the Singularity, all that, basically the performance sort of stacked up about where I would expect it. For uh, compute, like business compute and things like that, the card did shockingly well, mostly. So like FP32, it's really, really punching above its weight class. Yeah, a lot of the time on gaming GPUs, um, the type of compute that is found in scientific computing devices the type of floating point and other things like that is nerfed. I don't think Intel nerfed that on this card. I mean, it's still a $250 card, you know, don't expect any miracles, but for those types of benchmarks or for those types of computational operations, you have 12 gigs of VRAM and it's punching well above its weight class. So you're in like 4060 Ti, 7700 XT territory. Um, but overall for gaming performance, I think 7600 XT or even a little better than 7600 XT is what you can expect. And that is about where the performance was on Windows, assuming that Intel closes the loop on the performance and driver anomalies that we observed. And those may not even be Intel's fault. It, that may be just lag time between synchronizing the kernel teams and Git Mesa and, and everything else. Uh, but still, for Linux, with just the way things are in the Linux ecosystem, uh, it's very, very promising for the things that it falls short on and for the things that it does really well, it does much better than expected for a $250 card. For productivity and light gaming and running like a two or a three monitor setup, especially even high refresh rates, there's really not a lot of competing cards in that space. I mean, $250 is a good deal for what it is and it doesn't use a lot of power. The card doesn't get particularly hot even when it is using a lot of power owing to its good cooler and flow through cooling. So it's a good overall hardware design. I've tried to do testing on a variety of systems including an Intel 13900HX which is the Mini's forum 
ITX motherboard that you can order, a 9800X 3D, and even the Core Ultra, the Core Ultra 285K. I really thought that maybe the Core Ultra would have some magic in Linux because Linux's scheduler generally works better. Like there's a, there's a patch for Cyberpunk to make it run a little better on Windows with the Core Ultra CPU. And generally on Linux, it, Linux's scheduler has handled that better. So if Cyberpunk this whole time has been a much better experience on Intel on Linux than, than Windows. But the Core Ultra still falls short of um, the 9800X 3D and even other lesser expensive CPUs when it comes to gaming, which is too bad because the Core Ultra really is a nice processor for multi-core workloads and like getting work done. It's a lot of very powerful cores and generally the Linux experience with the Core Ultra has been much better than Windows. But bottom line with this GPU, the Core Ultra doesn't really help or hurt things very much on Linux because you know, 60 to 90 FPS on 1440. I didn't do as much um, upscaling testing on Linux as I did on Windows. I mean, of course, you know, like Cyberpunk will let you use FSR and you can use, you know, generally I found that to work a little better on Windows than Linux for whatever reasons than Intel's XESS, but theoretically all of that should work in Linux with the Proton interface mostly. There's a couple edge cases and gotchas, but mostly that should be an option. But I found that a lot of the Windows optimizations were around those upscaling and frame generation technologies and uh, Linux, Linux, I think, is, is suffering just a, a little bit when it comes to the bleeding edge stuff. Even as much Herculean work has been done by Valve and uh, Valve adjacent teams trying to make sure that we have a good gaming experience with Steam. I also didn't have a lot of time with this card, but I did try some of the off-label use cases that, that I'm sort of famous for. SRIOV, can you do SRIOV? No. GVTG, can you do some sort of like soft partitioning on this card in order to share it between? No. Can you do anything interesting on the PCIe side of things? Well, this card uses resize bar. It really depends on resize bar, which creates some implications when you're doing GPU pass-through. Physically, this is PCI Express 4.0 by eight lanes, and you really do need to use it with a PCI Express 4.0 by eight lane motherboard. You can get by with a PCI Express 3.0 on eight lanes, but just know that you're leaving a little performance on the table. At least that's what I found in my Windows review. Also try doing like containerization workloads and looking into stuff on Git to see what happens in terms of compute. And I'm gonna have to revisit Intel compute on this for like generative AI and AI applications because it is the most impressive thing this card is capable of that kinda but not entirely works. But overall, bottom line, very impressive card. Easily worth $250 in the current graphics card climate, but you know, bear in mind there's a bit of a wild card with whatever GPUs are coming from uh, Team Red and Team Green. And now we have Team Blue, so it truly is the RGB wars of graphics cards. And who knew in 2024 that Intel would have a much stronger mainstream volume GPU offering than their new CPUs. That's actually like kind of shocking and have I stepped into a parallel timeline accidentally? How do you spell Bernstein Bears? I'm one of this level one, Linux, and I'm signing out, and you can find me in the level one forums. Let's chat or run tests or do something. I don't know.